you very much, uh, uh, Dan and Christian, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and talk about uh, um, a topic which is, in my opinion, uh, quite interesting. So let me share the screen um, with you. Okay, the topic is uh, automatic speech recognition in the context of professional interpretation. Um, what I want to do um, today is to uh, present to you the relationship between AI, speech recognition is part of the AI, and interpretation give you a very non-technical and short overview of uh, speech recognition technology and the uses that we can do of speech recognition in the interpreting profession. Disclaimer, which is important, most of the thing that I'm presenting, especially the most practical ones, uh, are drawn, so to say, taken from my personal uh, professional experience, both at Google or at the university. Um, but I will reference uh, also uh, literature for further um, information if you are interested in, in this. Um, okay, the first thing I have to, to explain in a couple of words is the following concept that has to do with AI, which also has to do with speech recognition and with interpreting. So the key point of AI nowadays, the power of AI nowadays is that we have been able to do AI to solve problems without the need of being intelligent. Um, this is a very important concept uh, and there is very much confusion around about AI and intelligence, especially when we apply it to profession that require a lot of intelligence as interpreting is. Uh, in the picture that you see on the screen, uh, you see, um, it's a metaphor if you want, you see a robot playing music. This is the idea that most of the people have about AI when AI has the task of doing some uh, task that normally has been done by humans. So it replicates what humans uh, do. This is, however, not how AI works. We can do uh, things uh, with AI without the need of replicating the way humans do it, using intelligence, for example, uh, and achieve a similar goal. Uh, this idea is very important because it separates the need of being intelligent to the need of being able, being skilled to do something. And AI is not at all intelligent. Also, when AI is applied to language, AI is not intelligent. intelligent. However, the capability of AI to solve problems in the language domain is improving. And it's not improving in a linear way, but it's improving in an exponential uh, way. So it's accelerating uh, this uh, pattern of improvement. So AI applied to language doesn't need to be intelligent to solve problems. And this quality increase has brought us to develop AI um, solutions, let's call it like this, very generally speaking, that can uh, reach human level or even super human level when we're talking about language processing. So also speech recognition. So when we are talking about the ability to manipulate language, the level of AI is already uh, similar to humans. However, it's very important to keep in mind that this is one thing, the ability to manipulate language. A completely different area is the ability to commute, to use uh, AI for communication purposes. There is a gap between the ability to manipulate language, which is the system uh, or the linguistic system, and the ability to use it for communication purposes. And for this is AI far away uh, from reaching anything similar to human level. This distinction is very important uh, when we're talking about using AI to support or replicate some ability that normally humans have. So a great ability 
to process language, a very weak ability uh, to, to process communication. Now, because interpretation, one of the most distinctive characters of interpretation is speech, is spoken language, um, it goes without saying that a technology that is able to manipulate speech, language, speech, not the communication part again, but speech, may be very useful for some practical aspects of this profession, if this profession implies the use of speech. Uh, Pöchaka, which is a very renewed uh, uh, researcher in interpreting studies, formulated eight years ago uh, that A ASR, automatic speech recognition, is a technology which, with a considerable potential for changing the way interpreting is practiced. This is something I believe uh, too, and this is something that has uh, uh, guided, so, so to say, my uh, work, my research, my practical applied research in the field. Now, two minutes to understand speech recognition, okay? I put here six boxes, which are for me the key elements that we have to take uh, home, even when, even if we are not uh, experts uh, in uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. So we can really consider speech recognition as a black box. So you input audio, and from the speech recognition, you get a transcription. Very uh, common uh, knowledge. Speech recognition, this box, is a box in the box system. So what you see as a speech recognition is made of different components. It's not important what they are for us, uh, but they are different components. What is important for us is that they, these uh, architectures, this way to solve the problem of transcribing uh, is changing all the time. And it's becoming, at the moment, easier and easier uh, to build. This is very important to have in mind. Third point is that speech recognition can live, if you want, uh, on your machines, cell phone or computer, or in the cloud, somewhere on some servers. At the moment, the vast majority of these uh, speech recognition systems are on the cloud. We will see why it's important. Um, the tendency is to make, and they are on the cloud, uh, mainly because they require a lot of resources, of computational resources, and they're very heavy. Uh, so a normal machine uh, cannot uh, do, do this, and the processing required to do uh, the transcription. However, uh, technologies making this model, they are language models, smaller and smaller, more performant, and they are finding their way uh, more easily into uh, the edge, into your devices. Speech recognition could be offline or streaming. The difference is very important, but it's obvious. One is you give uh, the entire speech or the entire video, whatever, and you get uh, the transcription uh, offline. Uh, streaming means that you get the transcription while the speech uh, is unfolding. And this is important, not from an uh, uh, architectural point of view, but from a linguistic point of view. Of course, if you have to do it offline, you have the entire context that the machine can use to have a good transcription. If you do it streaming, you have to find a good balance from the info missing information of the future, or the people will say in the future, and what you're transcribing in this uh, exact moment. Speech recognition can be seen as a product or as, or as a technology. Is a product if you're using speech recognition to get a transcription for whatever reason you may need it, it's a final product. Or as a technology, if you use the speech recognition as part of a different application. I will show you some applications that use speech recognition uh, for uh, integrating them in uh, interpreting a workbench. The last point, which I think it's important to keep in uh, on the radar is that speech recognition is ubiquitous, uh, meaning uh, the technology is becoming more and more available and uh, everywhere. And this tendency will continue. One word about quality and speech recognition, because I 
I say the word that normally uh, before that uh, makes us a little bit uh, upset, that they say human parity. Mm -hmm. um, it depends what we consider as an output of a system uh, when we judge it. But just for your information, normally speech recognition is measured still nowadays in a very mechanical way with a word error rate, which is nothing as than the comparison between the transcription that you get from a machine and the reference transcription. So the, the gold standard of what you would expect uh, to have a transcription, uh, how you would expect a transcription to be done. Um, speech recognition performs really good now, but it's not perfect. Um, I will go into this in a bit. Um, speech recognition engines reach something like 5% of errors, meaning 5% of the words are wrong. And uh, uh, this depends on many factors, um, the language that you're using, uh, so that you want to transcribe, there is a bias if you want in the ASR ecosystem towards uh, languages that are very widely spoken um, compared to languages that have a smaller amount of people speaking them. Mm. Uh, it depends on the accent of people. Um, a little bit like humans. Uh, if you are uh, trying to understand a person speaking with an accent that you are not accustomed to, you have more difficulties. The same happens uh, with speech recognition. It depends on uh, the kind of speech uh, that you or the, the, the audio that you are transcribing. Uh, for example, speech recognition works very well for very formal speeches uh, and uh, badly for slangs or for informal speeches. So there are a lot of uh, variants, uh, uh, variables, sorry, uh, that can impact on the quality of the speech recognition. Speech recognition is also application dependent, which means there is no perfect transcription. It depends what you want from a transcription. If you want for a, a court, a verbatim transcription word by word, you will need a transcription engine that also makes a, a transcribe correctly the errors of the speaker. But if you want to use it for other purposes, for example, for a minute of a, a meeting uh, that you can read afterwards, you probably don't want errors, uh, grammatical errors or uh, discrepancies in the speech uh, be reproduced by the transcription. This is all important because there is no right transcription. By the way, this has nothing to do with the machine. It's just uh, the same if humans are doing transcription. And a very general problem that transcriptions like humans have uh, uh, names, proper names. Um, uh, if I say my name and I didn't teach the speech recognition engine that my name, Fantinuoli, is pronounced like this, you will never be able uh, to, do, uh, to transcribe it uh, the right way. And this has consequences for us. Uh, interpretation. Now, now that we have a very general uh, overview about the key points, at least, that are interesting uh, for, for um, our application of speech recognition in interpreting, let's see a, a couple of uh, possible applications um, of speech recognition. I picked up three um, that I'm working on personally. One is the preparation, uh, one is the evaluation, and one is the real-time support. I will show uh, the three of them. So let's start with preparation. Um, we know that preparation uh, is key uh, in professional interpretation, no matter if it's conference interpretation, court interpretation, medical interpretation. Preparation is key to professionalism. And, and, and uh, preparation need, uh, aims at bridging the gap of knowledge terminology, factual knowledge, uh, contextual knowledge, who is who, and so on, between the interpreters uh, and participants. What is done normally for preparation, and uh, there is a wealth of publication also in interpreting studies, is typically based on the work on written documents. So, for example, uh, the documents that some interpreter may receive by the conference organizer uh, or documents that the interpreter may find on the web uh, about a topic, about a, a person, and so on. The typical workflow 
is uh, to, 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 to read the documentation. There are some modern way to do it, it's to extract automatically terminology, prepare knowledge bases from these documents and so on. But this is based normally on written uh, texts. What is interesting is that the spoken domain has hardly been used for preparation uh, purposes. The exception is what interpreters maybe, and for sure may, many do it, uh, do using YouTube, for example, if they have to, to interpret uh, a speaker and it's a famous speaker with uh, uh, videos on YouTube, they will go online to learn how the speaker speaks, what are the topics the speaker normally uh, talks about, what is the terminology the speaker uses and so on, or about the subject. Uh, when I was a uh, pro an interpreter, working as an interpreter, and I had to do very technical conferences or uh, events, I used YouTube to learn how a machine was working, not to understand uh, the, um, the basic concepts. This is something that we do, but we don't use it in a, a pipeline of preparation. So what is interesting is that we can use... Uh, uh, ASR. Um, by the way, I, I put here some uh, some uh, um, reference uh, uh, now and then on some slides about uh, papers that you can read. And at the end of the presentation, I have the, the full list where you can uh, uh, deep um, deep dive into into the topic if you're interested from an academic perspective. So, what is a, a possibility that we are working on is to use. ASR for preparation in a pipeline for interpreters. So meaning that we use ASR, we can use ASR to harvest information from past meetings. Think about a large international organization that they have recurring meetings where interpreters are assigned to it. Normally they try to have the same interpreters because there is past knowledge about a specific topic or, or event, but not always it's uh, possible. What is possible to do now is to take the recordings of these past meetings and create a pipeline that you see on the right where you have the videos, when you, you use offline speech recognition to have a translation, a transcription of all the content, content, out of it, you get a written corpus of texts, which is relevant for the specific topic or for the specific conference uh, series and so on. Out of it, we have possibilities now to extract information, which are terminology, which are facts which are a context, who is saying what, and so on. And prepare this from uh, uh, unstructured data, which are the videos. You can watch all the videos, but if you have uh, proceedings of hours, the interpreter will not watch probably all the videos for hours. But you can take all this unstructured data and have at the end of this pipeline structured data. So it's a database. Uh, with terminology, with factual information, which are really, which is really relevant for this uh, event, and this information can be consulted by the interpreter. So the, com the pipeline that you see on the right is complex, but it's doable with technology that we have nowadays, especially for large organization or LSP, uh, or uh, think about the efforts of the international organizations, the parliament in Canada, in the European uh, Union, and so on. And the goal is really to give interpreters continuity of knowledge about uh, an event and bridge this gap, which is important to, to be bridged, this is about the preparation, why interpreter dedicates so much time in interpretation, in, in the preparation, to support interpreter, interpreter during this phase, but not with the traditional method of documents that are relevant for a conference or topic, but they are not coming out of this conference or topic, but using the past events, what people really said in the past events. This is one possibility of use uh, of, use of uh, speech recognition in a workflow for increasing quality at the end of the day of preparation. The third area, which is interesting, and, and this is a little bit unknown. I, I put here uh, some uh, papers uh, where there is some attempts of, uh, for example, from Gaber, Gaber 
uh, to, to, to formalize this kind of use. But it's a very uh, unknown territory uh, in, in the practical world. So it's something that is coming uh, now and maybe interested, interesting for um, institutional stakeholders and so on. The second area um, which I am uh, uh, doing research into uh, at the moment is the use of speech recognition as a component of automatic or semi-automatic evaluation of interpretation. Now, what is the idea behind it? Evaluation is in every profession, uh, or assessment, we can call it uh, as we want, um, is a key factor. We do it in academia when we uh, examine uh, interpreters coming to do a, a, a master, for example, or at the end when they finish the master. Um, industry, of course, professional associations, but also self-assessment is key. The challenge of evaluation is big. Um, evaluation is complex. Uh, it's done manually and it's a cumbersome process. And probably that's not the biggest problem. Uh, the biggest problem is it's very difficult to define what quality is. Um, there are many approaches, but if you look at the end of the day, even interpreting studies have not formalized uh, in a definitive way what is quality in interpretation, because it's a very difficult concept. It varies a lot. Everybody has difficult, different uh, ideas, and the quality depends from many factors, from what kind of interpretation, from the situation, um, from the clients. It's very, it's very difficult. Uh, still, evaluation is important. So we have this, this challenge. Evaluation, assessment of quality is important, but it's difficult. Because it's difficult, it's very difficult also to formalize it. Um, that's ex my experience as an evaluator at the university when I evaluate the students and so on. We have uh, formalized, try to formalize it. Uh, we have uh, uh, forms that we have to fill when we listen to uh, the rendition and so on. But at the end of the day, there is a big component which is very subjective in the way we perceive the interpretation, which is very difficult to be formalized. And when something is difficult to be formalized, it's also difficult to replicate it uh, from, from a computer uh, perspective. Um, so it's a big challenge uh, to automate or half automate evaluation. However, there are attempts, uh, especially coming from China um, and all the Asia region, uh, region to, to uh, apply uh, methodologies to um, the evaluation of interpretation. And here I have two uh, that I'd like to, to underline. Uh, one is a traditional QA model of evaluation, what you get from translation, written translation, uh, so to say. So you look really mechanic, mechanic, in a mechanical way in comparing source language and target language, for example, for, for some aspects of the interpretation that by the way, may be absolutely not relevant in some context, but where they are relevant, you can look and optimize, uh, for example, numbers, terminology, terminologies, I'm very keen about terminology because in, in some aspects of interpretation, nowadays, especially in conference interpretation, a clients require interpreter not to do just a good translation, and you know, you can translate things in very different ways, but to use their own wordings because this is the way uh, business uh, work. So do the interpreter uh, comply, for example, to this very specific aspect of interpretation? Uh, we know very well that interpretation is not made of only of these aspects. Or for example, silence. Uh, there is too much silence uh, compared to uh, the original, so maybe there was a problem there. And nowadays we can do this also with machine learning, which is a little bit a uh, second step, but this is the area where I'm working on. So to see, to look at the similarity, the semantic similarity of what has been said in the source language and in the interpreted language. And this is um, based on uh, vectors and machine learning stuff that they can depict now at some level of 
uh, quality, uh, the meaning of sentences. Some others propose, and this is the area where I'm looking into at the moment. Some others propose to use um, metrics derived by, by machine translation, the one which is very old fashioned and not very much used, but just to give the name because it's very famous is the blue score. So really comparing interpretation with the reference translation. Uh, so ad hoc, perfect, so to say, translation. But we know that interpretation, what is a perfect interpretation? Again, what the qualities people have, it's, it's a communication skill, it's not a language skill. There is language skill, skills involved, but it's communication. And communication, it's very difficult to measure uh, here. Um, but if you look into uh, these papers that I put here, what is most more, more interesting is not so much to point to the limitations of this kind of approaches, that just common sense would say, but you do not depict quality in this, but it's the correlation that we can find between what well, these metrics, the very basic metrics, um, that this metric correlate quite good to the human evaluation. So if humans evaluate uh, a performance of an interpreter using completely different methods, in some way we see that statistically, um, we see that there is a correlation. Uh, they are not very uh, going very uh, different ways. Even it's a little bit the image that we, we've seen at the beginning. Even if we use completely different approaches, uh, we get more or less very similar results. However, would be this um, an approach for using evaluation at scale, let's say for a bigger organization, uh, international organization? The answer is no. Uh, you cannot bring the burden of judging interpretation performance, interpreting performances to the machine. However, it can be used as a tool, again, to help a continuous evaluation of interpreters. So you can have, you can get some formal reports that a human, an expert, can receive flags, say, here the machine points to some possible problems. So look into it. This is the value that I see of the use of AI and speech recognition in devaluation. Uh, I've probably forgot to, to mention what is the role of speech recognition. And this is that the speech recognition is the first step in a pipeline for automatic evaluation to go from the speech to the transcriptions so or the written text and perform this kind of metrics and evaluation and so on, because we cannot perform them on the speech itself. We have to go through the transcription. I think there is potential here, but there is a lot of cautiousness that has to be applied. And uh, we will see it also in the uh, ethical aspects of using speech recognition in interpretation. Okay, let's go to the, sec the third areas where we can use speech recognition. This is the third area, which is the most advanced one. So it's really reusable in products and so on. Um, so you can use speech recognition for life support of interpreters while they are working, no matter the modality, consecutive, simultaneous interpretation, dialogue interpretation. And you can do it in very, very different ways. You can use what you normally see. Um, I can turn it on here. I, I don't know if you see the uh, live transcription now on my screen. I should have turned it on before for the purpose of accessibility. Uh, sorry for this, I'm doing it now. But you can really use this as an interpreter, this live real-time, you remember the difference between offline and real-time uh, speech transcription, to support you uh, as a backup uh, tool, so to say, when you were, for example, in simultaneous interpretation behind, beyond uh, the speech, you lost some parts, and you can look at this as a support and integrate information while interpreting. This is a very basic use. The other possibility, so it's speech recognition as a product hmm, for interpreters. 
The other possibility is to use speech recognition as a tool for, inter for um, uh, as a technology, sorry, in a tool for interpreters. For example, we have the digital booth man showing our video uh, where you can prompt the interpreter in real time, for example, in simultaneous modality um, with relevant aspects of the speech, for example, the terminology and the translations, for example, uh, numbers that are very big problem in simultaneous interpretation or proper names. Remember the problem with proper names that speech recognition intrinsically has. Or uh, the second video I'm showing you, you can use it as a notepad, uh, meaning to integrate uh, the consecutive modality or the dialogue modality and have the speech recognition help you doing a sort of side translation uh, of what has been said and written. So as a support tool to improve precision and quality of uh, your rendition. I'm showing you two videos. The first one is a product that we are um, we have developed at Kudo. It's a support tool for real for simultaneous interpretation. Um, it's not the final version uh, of the tool uh, as far as the UI uh, is concerned. It will be uh, also much better, but this is what I can show you for um, confidentiality reason. The second is a tool, a uh, free available tool developed at my university um, for consecutive interpretation. So just have a, have a look to have uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. Okay, so the, the, the speaker here is our speaker, and we will see the booth uh, console for the interpreter. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be back in Australia, to be back at the Opera House. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, as Anne's just said, I've written a novel, but I don't want to talk particularly specifically about the novel. Please buy it after if you feel inclined. But what I really want to do is to talk about some of the ideas behind the novel. And um, sometimes people say to me, you know, what, why did you even bother to write a novel? I thought you were supposed to be a non-fiction writer. And the reason I wrote a novel is that I believe that many of our ideas on love come from reading novels, also songs, films. Okay. Um, what you see is just a prompt uh, for uh, what we call a booth name. Uh, of um, what we think are important information for the user. You see two things here. First of all, that there are information that are absolutely not relevant, but it was just for the short of the video. I try to have as much information, even use, useless information, so that you could see the dynamic of these suggestions. The second thing is that there is quite a necessity to let the interpreter in the settings decide what is relevant for an interpreter, because we want the, inter the, the, the tool to be adapted to the interpreter needs, and they are very divergent, uh, and not the other way around, the interpreter adapting to the tool is very important. So it's the interpreter that has to decide, do I need just numbers? Do I need terminology? Do I need also other information? Do I need the running transcript and so on? So this is the idea of what we can do to increase uh, quality during the interpretation. The second one is a notepad for consecutive. So let's start the video. Anti-vaxxers blamed for 300% rise in measles. UNICEF has reported that measles cases worldwide have surged by 300% in the first three months of 2019. UNICEF's report came out on the same day that the USA's Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, reported that confirmed measles cases in the US are the highest they've been since the disease was declared eradicated in 2000. UNICEF reported that an estimated 169 million children worldwide have missed out on measles vaccines. It added that 110,000 people, mostly children, died from measles in 2017, up 22% from the year before. 
Okay, so you, you have seen, um, I, I started um, on, the, on the left side, you have um, the transcription highlighted, you get some kind of information, in this kind of case with just the numbers. Um, you have the possibility to use uh, translation tools to, to translate some uh, words that maybe you uh, do not know. And on the right, you can take your notes uh, as usual, probably less than before because you have the transcription. Um, this is the idea behind it. We do research about this. So let me give, before I, I end my talk, um, some, some very um, point-wise uh, results of empirical research done at the university, at my university in collaboration with uh, Frank de Bart, uh, the University of Ghent and other uh, universities. Uh, in what we have discovered when using these kind of tools uh, in real life. So um, we've done also a um, big uh, experiment with the European uh, Commission uh, last year, uh, I think, so with professional interpreters. So what we have seen is that suggestions, uh, even in, in the simultaneous modality that we know is very stressful and tired with time constraints, can be integrated. Um, there is not a big problem uh, in integrating this kind of information in real time. We measure an um, increase in precision of the quality. However, this is not something that uh, goes from zero to 100% in one minute. Uh, such things need to be trained. It's a, a, a new component in a radio complex setting which is interpreting. So it needs to be learned when to use this tool, when not to use this tool. This is very important not to use it in many contexts. Um, another point is that the consecutive, the using consecutive, I, I did this tool, but I never had the chance to do experiments on this, but I see that there are um, people doing experiments right now in other universities, and I'm very keen, on, so it's underexplored if uh, it's more an advantage to have such tool or a distraction to, have to use such tool in the consecutive dialogue uh, uh, interpretation. It is something that has to be seen. There is no doubt that we started, that there, are, there is a pro proliferation of uh, experiments, but it's not enough. Academia should um, engage more in experiments uh, with this kind of tools. Last things I want to say is important to have clear about some ethical aspects on using speech recognition, also in interpreting. We have to be clear that, as, as I said before, speech recognition, which is the foundation of all the applications that I show you, um, works differently based on the language. This is a problem general problem of uh, NLP, natural language processing. It must be known that there are bias in speech recognition, which is similar to the one of the languages. Uh, speech recognition works better for standard languages and not for, let's call it substandard. It's a not the right word to use, but you know, uh, slangs, uh, minority uh, people, um, mi minority groups using different accents, um, different wordings, and so on. This is not because speech recognition is biased per se, it's because just the data that are used are biased because when we train um, these systems, we use data that are available and we normally use data that are from the biggest communities. But this is an issue hmm, that has to be addressed. There is an issue about the privacy of data. If you remember, I told you about the cloud, versus edge uh, deployment of speech recognition. Nowadays, most are on the cloud. And this um, poses questions about privacy uh, when the meetings are very confidential. Topic that should be uh, discussed um, um, in a good way. Then again, there is the ownership of data. What happens when your data leaves you um, computer, your room. The same applies to Zoom that we are using now. And this is another topic that is very relevant for interpreters to 
uh, be aware of. And then there is concentration of knowledge of power, meaning that um, this kind of technology is owned by few. Um, even if there are uh, tendencies in the NLP community to make more and more uh, tools, also speech recognition tools, open source. But in the real world, at the moment, there is a concentration of power in this, and this is important. I come to, uh, I am at the end of my, at the end of my speech, what are, can we expect for the future? Uh, AI and speech recognition is part of AI, is here to stay, there is no doubt about this. There is a big uh, opportunity to improve quality, uh, to close the gap, the bias gaps that we have now. And this is what the NLP community is working on right now. So quality is going to improve. Um, availability of speech recognition is going to increase. It's becoming ubiquitous. Um, speech recognition has intrinsic limitations. It's obvious if you see in the transcription, uh, on screen, you see errors. Uh, however, uh, it is good enough to develop smart applications based on speech recognition. And this is my key uh, message. Uh, speech recognition for interpreters can open new opportunities, both for freelancers, increasing quality, and quality will be more and more important in the future with the machine interpretation also coming at some point. And for institutions to do properly this uh, digital, digital transformation that everybody's talking about. Speech recognition is a key in this area. So um, thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in papers and other stuff, you can look at the Center for Augmented Interpretation at my university, Kyle Unimines the A or my personal webpage, and you're free. Uh, to, to reach out to me at my email addresses that you see here if you have any questions at any time. Thank you very much.